Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Imani Rupert Gordon, and I'm the executive director here at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. We are a national legal organization, and we work to achieve and advance uh, civil and human rights for all LGBTQ people and our families. Our work is operationalized through litigation, legislation, public policy, and public education. Last week, the 303 Creative Decision came out, and we want to take some time to talk about what it was, what that means, and what we all can do. So we want to answer your questions as well. So the, uh, the Q&A segment is open. So feel free to, to drop questions, and then we'll get to those. But to start off, I'm just going to provide some context about the case. So in this case, uh, it was brought by a website designer who wanted to be able to create wedding websites for straight couples um, and specifically would not create websites for lesbian and gay couples. Uh, she claimed that Colorado's non-discrimination law would violate her uh, First Amendment right. Uh, this decision for the very first time, uh, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that some businesses will have the constitutional right to discriminate against uh, uh, customers, particularly those from a protected class. Um, so while this decision is certainly concerning, it, it does not open the door to blanket uh, discrimination. And I think that part is important because this is a narrow decision um, and, and it can and would only apply to a small subset of businesses. And we're gonna discuss that a little bit earlier. Um, not that this isn't concerning, but we don't want to give any sort of uh, undue credit to, to this. The last bit of context I wanna provide is that there are a couple of earlier cases that have made similar claims uh, that you've probably started to hear about again. So the first was the Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop of 2018. Uh, this case also came out of Colorado when uh, a gay couple argued that Masterpiece's uh, refusal to make a wedding cake for their same-sex wedding violated anti-discrimination laws in Colorado uh, because they would design and provide wedding cakes for heterosexual couples. Um, Masterpiece said they would provide another uh, pastry, but not a wedding cake. Um, in Masterpiece, the court did not address whether the bakery had to provide wedding cakes to same-sex couples. Instead, they held that um, Colorado Civil Rights Commission violated the free exercise clause, but the court did not rule on broader constitutional questions um, of freedom of religion and anti-discrimination. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that too. So if you didn't get all of that, uh, Julie's going to going to talk about that. Um, and then the second one was the Fulton uh, versus the City of Philadelphia uh, that was in 2021. Uh, in that case, it was discovered that Catholic Social Services was um, discriminating against same-sex couples by refusing to consider them as potential foster parents. Um, and it was a violation of the contract of the city um, because uh, that contract um, for uh, forbid discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Uh, Catholic Social Services claimed that the Constitution protected um, the free exercise of religion, again, uh, so they claimed that even though they refused to comply with the terms of the contract by discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation, that that shouldn't compromise their um, contract or ability to contract with the city because they object to this based on religious uh, beliefs. Uh, in this case, once again, the court uh, made a narrow decision siding with Catholic Social Services, but doing so only because there was a clause in the contract that made room for an exemption like this. Um, so it would only apply in that particular case and that particular contract. So I think that is enough background to get us started, uh, and so we'll, we'll be on the same page. Today, we're going to be joined by NCLR's Federal Policy Director, Julie Gonen, and NCLR's Legal Director, Shannon Minter, uh, and they're going to walk us through a bit more about what this means. So, Julie, we're going to get started with you. Um, why don't you tell us how this decision even reached the, um, the, the court? So, there is a legitimate question of standing. Uh, it, in a lot of ways, this seems a bit manufactured to give the court uh, another shot or another bite at uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, now that Justice Kennedy is gone. Uh, there's some facts that we now see aren't actually um, seem to be fake, and there's kind of some holes throughout this. Can you break this down for us? Absolutely. Thanks, Imani. Thanks, everybody, for being here today to talk about this uh, important decision. And I'm glad, Imani, that you set the stage a little bit by mentioning the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision from 2018, because there are some notable similarities and some really key differences between that case and this one, even though they both originated out of Colorado, they both involve the same anti-discrimination law in Colorado. 
So again, in Masterpiece Cake Shop, I think it's important to remember who was part of that case. So it was a couple of guys named David and Charlie who were getting married and they went along with Charlie's mom to Masterpiece Cake Shop to get to order a wedding cake. And they were turned away by the owner of that shop, Jack Phillips, um, who deemed himself to be a cake artist and he did not want to be seen as endorsing same-sex marriage by selling them a wedding cake. And as you mentioned, he said he would sell them other products, but not a wedding cake. So this couple brought their case to the Colorado Civil Rights Commission and said, this is a violation of Colorado's anti-discrimination laws. And they won before that commission and before the Colorado Court of Appeals. The case then went up to the US Supreme Court. And, and what happens when a case goes to the Supreme Court, they have the, the sort of flexibility to determine what question they believe the case presents and what question they're going to address. So in that case, uh, the question was whether the application of Colorado's public accommodations law, and I'll just say here, public accommodations is a fancy word for businesses open to the public, basically. Does Colorado's public accommodations law compel a cake maker to design and make a cake that violates his sincerely held religious beliefs about same-sex marriage, violate the free, free speech or free exercise clause of the First Amendment? And, and you'll note here, the way the court frames a question tells you a lot about where you think they're probably going to go with their decision. So here, the Supreme Court actually reversed. Like I said, the, the, the gay male plaintiffs won below, but the Supreme Court reversed. But it was interesting what happened here. What the court said was that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission's conduct in evaluating the cake shop owner's reasons for declining to make the cake, that violated the free exercise clause. They basically said that the commission did not treat Mr. Phillips in a neutral fashion because some comments that they made suggest that they had some animus toward religion. So the court basically took up this case, which they did not have to do, but then they punted on the core question of whether the First Amendment actually creates an opt-out from non-discrimination law. Meanwhile, this 303 Creative case was already working its way toward the, the court as well. So in 303 Creative, which is the case that the Supreme Court decided last Friday, the last day of its term, and also the last day of Pride Month, here, this time the challenger was not the same-sex couple, but it was the business owner. So as you mentioned, Imani, Lori Smith has a web design company, and she wanted to expand into doing wedding websites. She does not do them now. She did not do them at the time that this case was brought. She wanted to expand into that area of, of business, but not for same-sex couples. So there's the analogy to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. She did not want to be seen as endorsing same-sex marriage by creating websites because according to her religious views, same-sex marriages are false. So she filed suit to quote unquote clarify her rights because she was worried that if she did start offering wedding websites to the public, and a same-sex couple came to her that she would be found in violation of the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act. And this is, as you mentioned, where the, it gets a little bit interesting in terms of standing. So the, the short answer is this case never should have gotten out of the gate. Standing is a very important legal concept that says you have to have something at stake in order to go to court. You can't just wander into court and say, you know what, I don't like something, I want the court to do something about it. You actually have to show that you're affected by the law at stake and that there's an actual what the court likes to call a case or controversy. So um, in order to show standing here, what the, the majority opinion said that she had to show what they called a credible threat that the law would be enforced against her. And one of the things she pointed to to prove that was in fact the masterpiece decision. She said, look, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission does enforce this law against people in businesses like mine that are wedding adjacent. Um, but it's important to note that at the time, again, she was not doing wedding websites no actual requests by any same-sex couple had been put to her to make a wedding website. Um, there has been some new reporting folks may have seen in the last week that after the case started, she relied on, she said that she did in fact get an online inquiry from a potential client saying, oh, I might need some invitations and potentially a website for my forthcoming marriage. And it was a man request uh, and he was gonna be marrying another man. And she relied on that fact throughout the case. And now it turns out that this supposed person named Stuart who made that inquiry is a straight guy who's been married to a woman for 10 years and he never made any such inquiry. So there's a real, there's some shady stuff happening in the background of this case. But nonetheless, the court said, well, this is a pre-enforcement challenge. You can, you can challenge a law before it's enforced against you. But again, usually that involves somebody who's already doing the thing that the law prevents. Here, the plaintiff did not do the thing. She did not make wedding websites. So it clearly shows that the court really wanted to take this case. And I think 
not only does it show how eager the court was to take the case and some uh, real stretch to the standing doctrine, but I think probably what was very unfortunately smart by the other side is the optics. They didn't want a sympathetic LGBTQ party on the other side of the case. They didn't want the David and Charlie and Charlie's mom that we had in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. So all you had was, you know, poor Lori and her religious beliefs potentially being trampled by having to create wedding websites. So it's a very um, important posture because you're literally lacking the other side of the story here. There's nobody there to talk about what it means to be discriminated against and turned away from a business. Nonetheless, Lori Smith lost um, in the lower courts. Um, so it was not a good sign when the court decided to take the case. And again, the way the court framed the question matters. The court said the question is, quote, whether applying a public accommodation law to compel an artist to speak or stay silent violates the free speech clause of the First Amendment. So sort of an intentionally misleading framing because the law in question really re regulates the business's conduct, the act of discrimination, not artistic expression. The, the question really should have been whether someone who chooses to open a business to the public should have the right to turn away gay customers simply because the service would be expressive or artistic. And it's important to note too that the plaintiffs in both cases were represented by lawyers from Alliance Defending Freedom, which describes itself as protecting religious freedom, free speech, the sanctity of life, parental rights, and God's design for marriage and family. So they were reaching for cases, they got them up to the Supreme Court, and we got last week's decision. I'm going to turn it over to Shannon now to talk to us a little bit about what the court actually did in their, in their decision. Thank you, Julie, and, uh, and thank you all for, for being on this. Uh, this is such a tragic decision. It's so damaging in so many ways. And I'm, I'm glad that you're all here and I hope you can all help us sort of spread some of these messages because the other thing about this case is on the face of it, it's so difficult to understand. The ways that it is damaging, the true story behind it is not apparent just on the face of the decision, including the stuff that Julie just shared. This, is, this case, such a bad faith case. There's so much dishonesty and gaslighting surrounding everything about this case. And it's important that we all pierce through that and understand what's going on here and call this out and stick up for ourselves and for other marginalized people in this country. It's absolutely critical. So, you know, short version, what did they held? Well, they held in her favor. They held that this website designer has a free speech right to discriminate against uh, lesbian and gay people. Uh, I cannot put it better than uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent Today is a sad day in American constitutional law and in the lives of LGBT people. The Supreme Court of the United States declares that a particular kind of business, though open to the public, has a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class. The court does so for the first time in its history. Look, this historical context here is absolutely critical to understanding what this decision really just did. So. Uh, it is part of a long-standing campaign on the part of very powerful forces in our society to eliminate any anti-discrimination laws that apply to private businesses. There are powerful people and forces in our country that think there should be no such laws, not just about gay people, but about anybody. And this history is critical here. 1875, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. This is after the Civil War. They passed laws that would prohibit discrimination. This was primarily regarding Black people in all kinds of public accommodations in this country. The U.S. Supreme Court, many people don't know this history, the U.S. Supreme Court invalidated that law, struck it down in 1883 in the civil rights cases and held, nope, Congress does not have the authority to enact non-discrimination laws that apply to private actors, private people like businesses. They said, nope, can't do it. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery doesn't authorize it. The 14th Amendment requiring equal protection of the laws in this country does not allow that. You can regulate the government. You cannot regulate private parties. That ushered in a devastating period in our nation's history, the era of Jim Crow. They just went crazy. They just started enacting all kinds of discriminatory laws and be given a huge green light by the Supreme Court to do that. 
Fast forward, Congress again enacts the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And again, it's challenged immediately on, as saying, hey, you don't have the authority to do. Finally, the Supreme Court changed its mind and in not, not till 1964, almost 100 years later, did the court finally say, well, okay, I guess Congress, yes, you do have the authority to pass laws, public accommodation laws that apply to private businesses. It's not based on the 14th Amendment, it's based on the, on the Commerce Clause. Uh, but there are many people in this country who have never accepted that, do not accept that, were outraged by that decision and have continued time and time again to bring cases, trying to get the Supreme Court to say again that, that laws, public accommodation laws that apply to private people, private business somehow conflict with free speech, freedom of association, religious freedom. They've, and, and, uh, that's in uh, ju Justice Sotomayor's dissent talks about that as well. She says, time and again, businesses and other commercial entities have claimed constitutional rights to discriminate. And time and again, this court has courageously stood up to those claims until today. So you can begin to see the huge significance of this decision. We're, we're like back in 1883 in the civil rights cases in a way, like this is a breach in a wall that the court has held firm for a long time. And uh, it, it was no surprise to me that conservative, some conservative people understand this very well, what the significance of this decision is. And I'm just going to quote Ben Shapiro. He's got the biggest conservative podcast in the whole country. He immediately saw that this decision is has relevance, not to state anti-discrimination laws, which it's about, but to the Federal Civil Rights Act. He says the public accommodation provisions, this is a quote from him, of the Federal Civil Rights Act are, quote, wrong headed, an overstep in terms of constitutionality. If you act in business, you cannot discriminate. This allows the government to dictate who you must do business with. The federal, that, that, the only, the public, com, federal public accommodation laws only for practical purposes, for this relevant purposes for this discussion, only applies to race. So he is, he is seeing, Ben Shapiro is seeing what the court just held in this case about same-sex couples and marriage as opening the door to invalidating the Federal Civil Rights Act. So that's the, this context is hugely important here. And sorry to go on about this, but it's so important that we understand this. And you're not gonna get, I mean, Justice Sotomayor's dissent does cover some of this and please read it if you haven't. But I just want that is why this case is so tragic. It's so concerning, opening up, opening back up basic foundational principles of anti-discrimination law. And I just want to briefly say there's three tricks in this case that are designed to confuse the hell out of everybody. One is like, is this woman even a public accommodation? So the court at points makes a big deal out of the fact that the, this she said that she vets all of her customers. She doesn't just take all customers. She doesn't just open to the public and anybody who wants to come in and get a website design can get designed. She literally said, and it's a stipulated fact in here, that she vets, she, she intends to vet each prospective project to determine whether it is one she's willing to endorse. So, okay, so is that, why is she even a public accommodation then? So that just, it, it's just a strategic ambiguity. It's like, well, are you go only going to apply this holding to businesses like that that aren't really, really open to the public? Or is that just kind of a trick to make it seem like this is a more narrow decision and not so bad in this case, but you're just going to apply it much more broadly? Uh, so, so, you know, on the face of it, it's very narrow, as Amani said, and we need to hold them to that. We need to say, look, you said in here, it only applies to that type of business. We need to hold them to the literal words of this decision, even though they're trying to be tricky and confuse us about that. The other place where it's so confusing is the course is, well, hey, you don't want like a, a Muslim filmmaker to have to make a movie about a, a Zionism, do you? It's like, no, because you know what? Filmmakers are not public accommodations. Filmmakers, there's no filmmaker who's like, hey, anybody want to hire me to make a film? I'll make a film. That's not what filmmakers do. They're not, they're not regulated by public accommodations laws. They're not public accommodations. And if there was a filmmaker that did say, I'll make a film for anybody in the world, come on in, then yeah, they would have to make, they couldn't discriminate based on religion or any other protected basis. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but this decision is super tricky. It's tricky on purpose. It's confusing on purpose. It has like a lot of strategic ambiguity in it. And we need to hold them to the most narrow letter of the law application of what they just, the travesty that they just enacted in this decision.
Julie, I think it's back to you now. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll pick up on that a little bit. That's it's a really good, I mean, point. I think you can sort of view this decision as both very narrow and also very broad because as you touched on, Shannon, they made a big deal of, of all these stipulations, which is basically things that both sides agreed to, which is that, you know, these websites are expressive. I'm not sure why the state stipulated to some of these things, but basically what I find so interesting about this case and the one prior is how much these business owners sort of insert themselves into the weddings of their customers. Um, maybe that is in fact how they feel, but really what, what was kind of core to her claim was that she said that she would be speaking through these wedding websites to the, the world at large and therefore endorsing a kind of marriage that she feels is false, even though these are people that are paying her basically to build a website and put you know, the date and time and location on it. Um, so the fact that she, she framed it as being extremely expressive was key to the way the court ruled. And I think as Shannon said, we need to sort of keep lifting that up because they didn't say any kind of business can discriminate. So it was narrow in that regard because it's only supposed to apply to these so-called expressive businesses. It's broad, however, in, in the sense that it, it wasn't at all limited to LGBTQ customers. Any prote prote protected class could potentially run, you know, run into this and be victimized by these exemptions. So it, it would, there's nothing in it that says this would only apply to you know, same-sex couples or wedding-related businesses at all. And that's, I think, one of the things that's really troubling about this, this decision is the lack of what we call a limiting principle. So there's no, there's no outer boundary at all. And this is, this is one of the things that you get to do when you're a Supreme Court justice. You can hand down rulings and provide no guidance whatsoever about how that is supposed to apply to the rest of the world. So um, here, I think the fear, as Shannon said, is that this could be a real invitation for others who don't believe that private businesses should have to treat all comers to start pushing the limits. So, so where are the outer bounds? What is in fact an expressive business? Okay, maybe you making a website is, the Supreme Court just said it is, but uh, I was listening to a podcast. I don't know if folks listen to Mark Joseph Stern. He um, He's an interesting and entertaining person to listen to with his take on what the court did. You know, his example was, what if a, a Dairy Queen employee wanted to rebrand themselves as an ice cream artist and refuse to provide, you know, give ice cream to a transgender person because that would somehow be seen as an endorsement of that person's identity. The dissent, Justice Sotomayor's dissent, I agree, is, is worth a read. She cites the case and it wasn't a hypothetical, it was a funeral home that would not hold a memorial service for a gay decedent because again, they didn't want to be seen as endorsing um, that person. Um, what about other kinds of uh, sort of arguably expressive businesses that are really, really important moments in people's lives, like birth announcements or, or family portraits or, or epitaphs on a grave? Though, you know, there are businesses that provide those services. Do they get to pick and choose for whom they're going to do that? Um, many business owners could take this invitation and start claiming that serving someone they disapprove of on any number of grounds conveys a message of approval and then seek exemption from these non-discrimination laws. And the majority written by, uh, this pin was written by Justice Gorsuch, concedes that. I mean, he literally says that determining what qualifies as expressive activity protected by the First Amendment can sometimes raise difficult questions, but then says that's not this case. And we don't have to deal with that today. And it's, again, I think I find it very frustrating when the court does this because they're holding, they're handing down these hugely important decisions. And again, providing no guidance as to, to what the limits might be. So this is, you know, I think the first time the Supreme Court has started to sort of chip away at um, marriage equality since the Burger fell, not marriage itself, but what it means to be married and, and what that status actually, you know, provides to you. Um, and it comes at a time when our community is under attack on so many fronts. So it's just, it, it's painful and it's harmful. And, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about the economic and dignitary harm that comes from being turned away in the marketplace. And again, Justice Sotomayor does a really good job of talking about the purpose of public accommodations laws. It is about economic integrity, but also about dignity that, that comes from being, being told we don't serve people like you here. So, um, I think Shannon, you you started to touch on this a little bit, but I think that um, maybe it's it's important to also place this decision in the context of other things that the court has been doing recently, and it's kind of radical swerve to the right. Yeah, look, just to, just to underscore, the the court said that this applies to a business where the business owner vets each and every customer, where uh, she sits down with each customer and designs some unique highly individualized, customized work that is 
art that is characterizes art and that somehow when it's put into the world it's supposed to be clear that this is her voice her message her speech not those of the customers these are made up facts the whole case is made up these facts were retroactively gerrymandered engineered to try to make this seem like a reasonable ruling but like I, as i said before the, the goal is to have it be these very specific very narrow facts but then apply it to any business that's arguably expressive so that's why we need to hold them to those all of those facts our position needs to be the only business that could qualify for a free speech exemption under this decision has to meet all of those criteria which would be very few businesses and the other side is going to try to push it much broader and we got to make the court know they cannot undermine all of civil rights law here without paying a very heavy price. But yeah, we need, but Julie, to your point here, we've got to understand it's so important to see this in the broader context. This is a runaway court. I mean, this is a court that is on a mission. This is a court that is in direct partnership with some very reactionary forces in our society to as quickly as possible, as brutally as possible, as in it, in, in as widely as possible, dismantle constitutional law as we have known it and dramatically rewrite it in a very scary way that authorizes all kinds of dangerous, harmful things, discrimination and, and other harmful things in our society. So just don't, let's do not forget, this is a court that has issued an unprecedented number in a very short time of decisions that really gut people's ability to unionize and to, for organized labor to represent workers. They have drastically changed the landscape for organized labor and made it much more difficult. This is a court that do not forget just reversed Roe v. Wade and said there is no right to reproductive freedom in this country. This is a court that literally took the landmark civil rights decision of our time, Brown versus Board of Education, which said that racial discrimination in schools is unconstitutional. They literally just said, turned Brown completely upside down, said that, oh, actually Brown prevents colleges and universities from addressing race discrimination. They, what else have they, oh yeah, they gutted the, uh, so they reversed, they got rid of affirmative action in colleges and universities, they gutted the Voting Rights Act. And now, again, for the first time, they've held that just ordinary anti-discrimination laws infringe on free speech. Again, a goal that has been held since the civil rights, since 1875, when, the, when Congress first enacted the first civil rights acts in this country to address the aftermath of slavery and the history of profound race discrimination in this country. So we've got to, we cannot lose sight of this larger context. This is a runaway court that is way out of step with the people in this country and that is doing very bad things through the most basic principles and values that we all cherish and share. And we have to keep saying that. Thanks so much, Shannon. You know, I also wanted to put this into a broader movement context as well. Um, we've been saying for some time that the anti-LGBTQ bills work together. This is about dividing our community. It's about having us censor ourselves, making discrimination possible and sound like it's not as bad as it is. The don't say gay bills um, are an attack on our education system and it's supporting these exact same efforts. If we're unsure of when and how we can even talk about talking about our identity, then it's easier for us to understand how this discrimination can happen. If we teach kids in school that there's something not quite right about talking about an LGBTQ identity, it teaches us that when discrimination happens against these communities, that it's somehow warranted. And this isn't only specifically to LGBTQ bills. The book bans, the attack on critical race um, theory, or teaching the honest history and significance of slavery in this country are just as related to this attack against our education system. Not being able to pass common sense voting laws, um, making it difficult or nearly impossible for some people to vote, uh, making it possible for elections to be won and ballot measures to be passed while systematically ignoring communities of people. The recent uh, decision for the, the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, it's a reminder that there are legitimate institutional barriers keeping some communities out of higher education. We have to remember that affirmative action is a solution to, cor to correct an uneven playing field, which 
is something that might be a bit easier for some people to remember if the impacts of race theory and slavery weren't so blatantly left out of public education. We have to remember these things are related. Over the last 50 years, our opponents had been working to overturn Roe, making abortion illegal. And it started by adding limitations to abortion. And then last year in the Dobbs decision, the Supreme Court overturned um, our constitutionally protected right to abortion. We have to remember, we cannot look at these things individually. When we see these bills, we have to look at them like our movements are not separate. This 303 um, creative decision is narrow on its own, but it belongs in this long list of coordinated attempts to chip away at the rights of protected classes. And this is happening right now in plain sight. So when we see the healthcare bans for trans folks, uh, the sports bans, the book bans, the attacks on affirmative action, gerrymandering attempts to limit who can vote um, and the weight of their vote, the right to bodily autonomy, the right to abortion, we have to see these things as ways that they're trying to make discrimination seem more palatable. So when people tell us that we don't need to pass the Equality Act, that we don't really need it, this isn't true. We absolutely need protections enshrined in law because this Supreme Court is wild and we need all of our protections and we need as much protection for our protections as possible. I wanted to give just a little bit of time to, did anyone else, before we get to questions, does anyone else wanna say anything about what this means or just sort of in closing before we get to uh, to questions? Melinda, I should have mentioned also the recent decision striking down, uh, you know, President Biden's uh, loan forgiveness. Uh, that was, you know, and again, based on this newly discovered made up doctrine, major questions doctrine, which just means the Supreme Court, anytime there's a regulation it doesn't like, it can say, nope, that that's too big. That's too big a decision. It violates the this major questions doctrine that we that we just made up. That's an excellent point. Thank you, Shannon. Let's see. I want to get to there's a lot of good questions. There's a lot of good questions. Okay. Um let's look at the first one. Can businesses affirmatively um, can everyone see, I'm, I don't know if everyone can see this, um, affirmatively advertise on their websites and other marketing materials that they do not serve LGBTQ plus people if their services provided are allegedly expressive speech. Yeah, that's what the court just held. They held that this woman can post on her website that, hey, I'm not going to design a website for same-sex couples. Yeah, that's one of the worst, most shocking aspects of this decision. Yeah, the Colorado law in question actually addresses both things that about the discrimination and not being able to advertise that you're going to discriminate. So it literally, and again, Justice Sotomayor picks up on this, these it's sort of the the new the digital age equivalent of the sign in the window saying we don't serve gay people. Um, this next question, uh, does anyone have a comment on the SCOTUS order, Klein versus Oregon, uh, Bureau of Labor granting cert? Uh, vacating or judge uh, uh, or in judgment uh, and uh, I'm sorry, just closed. Uh, can someone read that? I'm so sorry, my Q and A just closed. <laughs> yeah, the, it's just a question, uh, Kathleen. Good question about what is you know is there the, what does it mean that the Supreme Court remanded this case in light of its decision in 303? This is another case that poses similar issues. I don't think in and of itself uh, it's yeah, of course, it's going to remand all those cases that raise these same issues. It doesn't mean that 303 resolves that case. And again, it's up to us to hold the court to its word in 303 and to this narrow application. So sure, fine, remand that case. And I hope it comes out, you know, it should come out the same way on remand because that the business there does not meet those very narrow criteria. Thank you. The next question, could you also touch on when you think marriage equality will be challenged in the Supreme Court again? How soon? What is at risk and what is the timing? Well, I don't know when it will be challenged again. Uh, this was, as Julie, I think, mentioned, and as the court itself you know, noted, uh, the symbolic impact of 303 is, is so bad because 
we're in the middle of attacks on LGBT people and the court chose this time, as, as the dissent said, instead of reaffirming the, the court's commitment the constitution's commitment, our country's commitment to equality for all, the court dealt the symbolic blow to LGBT people, it's very demeaning. Um, so th this decision will invite more attacks on marriage equality. It's certainly going to invite more businesses to start discriminating against same-sex couples. It will call forth discrimination that wouldn't otherwise have existed. I, you know, I hope that still most businesses won't take up that invitation, but certainly, certainly some will. So I don't know what the ri I mean, I don't know what the timing is. The risk, I don't know either. I mean, it's been pointed out that there's not, not one word in the majority opinion says anything about Obergefell at all. Nothing to point out, affirm as in contrast to Masterpiece Cake Shop, which certainly did. So that, you know, that sends a message in itself. I mean, I hope this court, I hope even this court would not have the nerve and the gall to reverse Obergefell but um, I don't know. I'm not sure I put anything past this court at this point. Well, and arguably, Shannon, this is the second invitation from the court in about a year to do that because, Amani, you mentioned the Dobbs decision last year that overturned Roe versus Wade. And, you know, the other side or those who oppose to abortion rights like to, to portray Roe as some sort of outlier case that just dropped, you know, from the sky. But it was part of a, a really important line of cases, the substantive due process cases that were building on the development of, of individual rights over time. And as a lot of folks probably know, in his concurring opinion in that case in Dobbs last year, um, you know, Justice Thomas did say that a lot of other cases in that substantive due process doctrine should be re revisited, including Obergefell. So that was a pretty clear invitation as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so. Hi, thanks so much for this. Hi, Ali. Um, what are uh, what are the cases currently in the pipeline that would determine the contours or limitations of 303 Creative? Do we know any of those yet? And what's the best way to limit the damage from this runaway court? There's not a lot of cases in the pipeline. Uh, the one was just mentioned, I think there's at least one more uh, out of New York, I believe. There's not tons of them because honestly, in a lot of these cases that have uh, that have, have in, in the recent past that have started off, uh, you know, they've been filed and there have even been decisions, they've been mooted out because it turns out they're, the underlying facts are fake. Like the, there, there's a, an interesting uh, column that's going to be coming out on this, this soon by Adam Unikowski. And if you don't follow his blog, I encourage you to sign up for it. Um, he's going to be writing about that. Uh, same way the facts here were fake and cooked up. Um, some of the recent cases have similarly just disappeared because there's no there there to them. Um, but it, there are a few, there are a few cases in, in the pipeline. Uh, uh, and what is the best way to limit the damage? I mean, you know, like I said, we just really have to pierce through the gaslighting in this decision and, and, and say, look, you said this applies to businesses that meet these very strict criteria. We're holding you to that. We're going to be very aggressive in litigating, uh, you know, weighing in and litigation around these cases and, you know, with amicus briefs and helping state AGs defend their laws. We do need, we're going to need to be very smart because this was a very smart, manipulative, strategic, completely manufactured decision designed to confuse the heck out of all of us. So resisting that confusion, maintaining our clarity of focus and vision here is gonna be really key. Absolutely. Um, there are a couple of questions now. Is there a strategy to expand the court now um, uh, being pushed to Y with one? Um, yeah, there, so, so questions about expanding the the court. <laughs> Julie, you want to take that one? I can take a little bit. I mean, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, the court, part of what I think comes through in a lot of these decisions that, that Shannon's been describing, not just in this context, but in others, is the court clearly sees itself as being sort of just above it all. And, and it's, it's completely unaccountable, even though it is supposed to be just one of three co-equal branches of government. So as folks are aware, and as the questions reflect, there are a lot of discussions about what we can do 
to, to rein it in. And there are ways, you know, some are harder because, um, you know, the justices have, have a life tenure according to the constitution. Expanding the court is something that could be done technically easily by statute, but of course you'd need the political will to do that. It doesn't seem to be there at the time. One of the, the proposals that I find pretty intriguing, um, the Brennan Center for Justice put out a report on this recently, um, which is sort of a form of term limits, but one you can sort of get away with without having to amend the constitution, which is to create, um, they're proposing 18 year terms that are staggered and it would be done in such a way that any president during one term would only get two appointments and it would just become more regularized. And the way you get around the life, the um, the lifetime tenure is they would be the justices would, would go into a senior status. So they're still technically on the court, but they wouldn't actively hear cases unless there was a recusal or they could they could be um, they could sit by designation in lower court. So they they wouldn't be losing their status as a Supreme Court justice, but they wouldn't be weighing in on cases. So you would have a court that would be more in sync with where the country is politically. So uh, you know, I just put that out. It's an, it's an intriguing concept, and I think. Everything and it should be on the table now. We need to be looking at the court. You know, how does it, how is its composition arrived at, and 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 what can we do politically? Of course, that's going to be the the big the big roadblock. So there's also a question about um, hope or plan in the future um, uh, from a legal uh, standpoint. We talked about the cases coming up. Um, I think we've talked a bit about uh, about this, but I do think that it is important that we start talking about how these are connected and do a better job of that. Um, I think a lot of times our opponents rely on us just sort of following and and just trying to work within the confines of what's uh, of what's there. But we're seeing now that this is just that this is wild, and I really do think that there is something to be said that there is a limit to the way that we are, are understanding education and looking back on what's happened in the past and being able to use that in the future. And I think that those things are connected and we really need to start thinking about them. Um, is there anything else that folks wanna, wanna add to that? Well, we do need to be more creative and aggressive. I was so happy to see that just a few days, maybe weeks after the uh, affirmative action decision, there's now a lawsuit challenging legacy admissions and you know, challenging them as having a racially disparate impact. And I, I love that, that's great. I'm so glad that is happening. And I don't know the exact analog of that in, our, in the LGBT public accommodation context, but I just love the creativity and the refusal to just lie back and become passive. That's the big danger here that we just feel overwhelmed, it's death by a thousand cuts. We just sort of passively accept all this that becomes the new normal and that we can't, we're so gaslighted and disoriented and destabilized that we can't even clearly even articulate or identify what's what's going on. And we just, every, all of us have to resist that with all of our might. Yeah. Um, there was a question here. Um... Uh, I'm still very confused about one simple detail. How did this website uh, company uh, company become a place of public accommodation? And can any public place now claim this? Yeah, it is because it makes zero sense. Because like you just look at the business that she actually runs, which is like website design, not for weddings, but for other stuff. Yeah, she just looks like an ordinary public accommodation, open to the public kind of place. And you know, the, the state of Colorado stipulated, which I wish they hadn't, that she was a public accommodation, but then she also got them to stipulate that she bets the customers, which is completely not compatible with being a place of public accommodation. So there's an internal unresolved contradiction in this case that again, I think was on purpose. Like they want it that way, so make, the, make it seem more reasonable because oh, well she, she just bets everybody, but then, well, then you're not a public accommodation, but they've stipulated she is a public. So it's just like, yeah, you're not, you're not confused. It is, it makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, there is another question that showed up um, in the chat. So in 303, the businesses had just one owner and the objection to providing the service was a reflection of her belief. How far does 303 go closely held um, closely held companies, publicly traded companies. 
That's an, actually a really interesting question um, and an important fact to pick up on. I think that there's something that really lent itself to what the court was doing here by having a business that was just a sole proprietorship, right? Because then it's it's an individual saying, you know, I have religious beliefs and I express them through my through my business. This reminds me a lot, actually, of the infamous Hobby Lobby case that folks might remember from almost 10 years ago now. This was a business, well, Hobby Lobby, which is a large company. It's not publicly traded, but it's a large company that didn't want to comply with a requirement under the Affordable Care Act to provide contraception through its employer-sponsored health plan. And the court, this was under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, so it wasn't a constitutional case, but for the first time, the court said, well, yeah, this is a closely held company. It's owned by one family, even though it's huge and employs thousands of people, it's closely held, meaning it doesn't have, you know, it's not publicly traded, so just a small number of people hold it, and they have religious beliefs um, that tell them they shouldn't be providing this contraceptive coverage, and therefore said that the company could es essentially have religious beliefs too, and could get out from under this statutory requirement that otherwise it would have had to comply with. And again, the court tried to frame it as, oh, this is very narrow. This is just about birth control. It's just about closely held companies. But that case actually got cited in one of the cases that eventually ended up before the Supreme Court in the Bostock case. Uh, an employer in Michigan said, well, I don't want to employ a transgender person, so I shouldn't have to comply with Title VII because it violates my religious beliefs to do that. And like in the lower courts, that, that claim actually won. It got dropped later on. But it, it, these cases, these decisions, when they say that they're narrow, basically don't believe them because somebody will pick it up and run with it. So again, it's a, it's a good observation on the, on the part of the questioner that the fact that it was closely held probably helped you know, tee the system up the way it did, but there's, there's nothing that would limit it like that in a future case necessarily. Thank you for that, um, Julie. And maybe just to put a finer point on this, this is a question. Um, how might LGBTQ families be blindsided by the consequences of this decision in their daily life? Uh, example, uh, you know, uh, being denied uh, service or kicked out of restaurants, travel, uh, travel agents, et cetera. And right now in this moment, how do you see that playing out? Julie, you want to do that one? Or, um, Amani, I know I just I know I just said the question, but I uh, hold on, hold on. I just closed it, so I hold on. Well, it's just... about whether we can be blindsided, and I think uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's absolutely. hard to see for sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, there we all. I remember. I mean, this, I don't know if this thing still exists. Back in the day, there was like a guide you could buy as a gay traveler to make sure if you're going to another city that you could find gay friendly businesses so that you wouldn't run into this kind of thing. And I know that there there have been similar things for for Jewish travelers, for Black folks traveling in the South, like those. Those things exist, but they shouldn't have to exist. We shouldn't have to sort of figure out like navigating the businesses that are and are not going to treat us the same as everybody else. So I guess the, the short answer, unfortunately, is yes, we, we could be. I mean, the, the maybe silver lining, or maybe if it's more than a silver lining, I mean, polls show we know that the majority of people don't believe in this kind of discrimination. I think most business owners don't either. But there are those out there, as Shannon said, who have always objected to the fact that they have to be open to all and some are going to take this decision and run with it, but we'll be on the lookout for them. And as Shannon said, we've got to we've got to do our best to try to keep this, you know, ruling as narrow as possible for as long as we can. Justice Sotomayor's dissent talks about this very thing very eloquently. Talks about a whole range of contexts where families could absolutely be blindsided, you know, from funeral homes to birth announcements, graduation ceremonies, anniversary events. Yeah, the, as, as she points out, the places in your life that are most personal and meaningful to you and where you're most vulnerable to the impact of unexpected discrimination. Yeah, I think this creates real vulnerability for LGBT people in our country, sadly. And I think the other thing is how um, it's just going to make some people afraid to go places. And I think that's something that we have to think about. Just not knowing what it means, not knowing if some individual, some individual business might say, well, and, and some, you know, woefully 
uh, inappropriate interpretation, say, well, I don't have to serve you for whatever reason. That doesn't change in the here and now that you just want to go and buy your groceries, that you just want to be here with your friends or around your, and not wanting to go somewhere, knowing that you could be discriminated against, knowing that you could be embarrassed. And I think that part is really um, concerning and it's very, very scary. Um, next question. Um, it's a, let's see, is there a potential of this case being overturned due to it not being a uh, true case, but hypothetical? Uh, and can we counter hypothetical uh, to set a better precedent? It's interesting. I don't think it will be overturned because of that, but we need to never stop talking about this. They relied on fraud, what appears to be fraudulent evidence. That is horrifying terrible and we should not, we should never stop saying it. I mean, this decision should never have gone for, I mean, this case should never have gone forward. They totally ignored their own standing rules and allowed this petitioner, this plaintiff and the law firm representing her last defending freedom to rely on what appears to be falsified evidence. It's just really shocking and terrible. Let's see, I think I missed a question here. Hold on just a second. I'm sorry, I think I missed one. Well, there's one of Billy Mally. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, Al, you're asking a lot of success on litigating the gender affirming care bans, but. Mm -hmm. Trans healthcare cases going up to the Supreme Court. I'm worried they might grant cert. For some reason I shouldn't be worried. No, you should be worried. Of course, we're all worried about that. Um, it, it won't, it, there's a decent chance there won't be a conflict. I mean, so far we're winning all of them, even in front of really conservative judges um, with really solid records going up. So if we can keep, you know, make, hold this up, keep winning them all, there won't be a conflict for the Supreme Court to resolve. And even if eventually there is some outlier case, it'll still be a lot harder for them to rule the wrong way if, if the vast majority of cases below have gone the right way. And these cases do rely heavily on Bostock and the analysis there, which I think Justice Gorsuch is very, you know, hopefully invested in. They don't raise any of these like free speech, religious liberty issues. Um, so even if it goes up, we should have, you know, a decent chance of, of prevailing. I mean, if it was anything, if it was anything remotely approaching, you know, a fair court, we we certainly would. But even with this court, we have, I think we have a, a, a significant chance of winning. Thank you. Okay, I think this is the one I missed. If Shapiro's business is not a public accommodation, what is it? Uh, a private business not subject to Colorado public accommodations law. That's close to something that we had, but Julie, you wanna take that one? Yeah, um, yeah, and I think she clarified it later to Lori Smith. So uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've gone back and forth. We've um, talked about what is a public accommodation and why it's confusing. And, and the majority in the dissent have kind of a conversation about that too. Justice Sotomayor talks about the history of public, public accommodations laws. They did used to be somewhat narrow. It used to be things like hotels and trains and restaurants. One of the things that's been happening, which is good, is that the anti-discrimination laws have gotten broader, both in terms of who they cover, who are protected classes, and the kinds of things that are considered to be public accommodations. And it does vary a little bit by state, but in Colorado, it is basically any business that's open to the public. So what isn't a public accommodation would be a private club. They are not subject because you're not holding yourself out to the public. By definition, that's a, that's a private that's a private actor. One of the things that the court does here that I think is sort of, I don't know if it qualifies as gaslighting, Shannon, but they they sort of use uh, the wrong line of cases to justify what they've done here. They talk about cases that really did uh, deal with entities were arguably not public accommodations, like the Boy Scouts and a, and a, a parade um, where they said, you know what, the there was an Irish American parade that didn't have to allow a gay float. The Boy Scouts didn't have to allow a gay scoutmaster, but those are not businesses open to the public. And the court tries to situate this case as an extension of those, and the dissent calls them out for that too, saying that those are not at all the same thing. Businesses open to the public are just that, they need to be open to everybody. Yeah, there's, there's hard questions about when private associations 
are or are not public accommodations. But there's never been any confusion about commercial enterprises, businesses that hold themselves out as open to the public, that court has never even come close to recognizing any kind of free speech, freedom of association exception to anti-discrimination laws in that context. And yeah, back to the, the example of the filmmaker or, or like a, a an artist uh, like Annie Leibovitz, who's, you know, Annie Leibovitz is not a public accommodation. She won't just take his photo. She picks and chooses. You can, you can be in business. You can be an artist or a writer, a, screenwriter, a speech writer, a blog writer, and not be a public accommodation because you're not open to the public. You select your clients on an individual basis. You're not hanging out a shingle and being like, hey, if you need this service, just come to my door, I'll serve anybody. If you do that, you're a public accommodation. If you don't do that, you're not a public accommodation. It's, and if you don't, she could have set herself up in business in a way that she was not a public accommodation, but she's trying to, you know, as we say, like eat her, eat her cake and have it too, because the whole thing is made up. She doesn't offer these services at all. This is all just a hypothetical, well, I think I might like to one day, but if I do that, I don't want to serve same sex couples. Oh, and if I do it, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to pick everybody real carefully. I'm going to sit down with everybody and do an individualized, you know, it's all just, it's all just made up facts to justify retroactively uh, a result. Thank you so much. We are right at our time now, um, but I do want to encourage you, if you have some additional questions that you can uh, reach out to us, you can email me and I can make sure that they're, uh, that we forward them. Uh, my email is I, Rupert Gordon, I-R-U-P-E-R-T-G-O-R-D-O-N at nclrights.org, and I can make sure that we, that we get you an answer. Uh, but I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank the team for um, making it easier for us to understand what we're talking about and putting this into a shared context. Um, and then I just want to um, leave you with a reminder that we need to pay attention to what's happening. We always need to put this in a broader context. And we need to remember that the fight is not with us, it's with our opponents. And so any, any time that's working, any effort that's working to separate our movements, um, that that's something that's uh, problematic and something we should always think about. I think you all know how much I love to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw um, and Bayard Rustin. Crenshaw says that if we aren't intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. And Bayer Rustin says, we must be in every other movement for the freedom of people. These are both ways of saying that our movements are intertwined in our path forward. We cannot forget this. I want to thank you again for being with us. You can find out more about our work at nclrights.org. And again, if you have questions, I can make sure to get answers to you um, at I, Rupert Gordon at nclrights.org. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care and be brave.